to get started with our panel today. Thank you. Great. Um, like I was, I was saying just in, in the group, group, group chat that my name is Jay Price. I'm um, with the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Study Center and adjunct professor with the Library and Information um, School at, at the University of Oklahoma. So welcome Sooners. Um, also, um, I'm happy to be here today and see all the participants, 38 it looks like that we have. And our panel, um, I'm very impressed with. I did my research and uh, your bios were very modest. So I added to them just a little bit because um, I think they're super relevant to what we're discussing today. And we're discussing such an important um, thing to archivists and librarians and everybody. So um, first of all, I, let's uh, introduce everybody. First, we have Dr. Mita G. Karstarfen. Um, and Dr. Karstarfen joined the Gaylord faculty in 2002, becoming the first tenured African-American professor in its history thus far, which she did not put in her bio, but I added that because it's awesome. Um, she received the first Gaylord Pro uh, Professorship Award in 2005 for her proposal to explore the legacy and cultural impact of 1008 American Indian and African American newspapers published in the 19th century, which there are so many fascinating ones. Um, she subsequently pu published The American Indians and the Mass Media in 2012, which was the only text about the subject that explored Indian media representation, history and law from both native and non-native contributors. Her research also explores the intentional use of mediated communication to create transformative, collaborative, and diversified social change. Um, so welcome, we're glad to have you. And I've, I've read a couple of your publications and they're brilliant. We have Dr. Tracy uh, Boyles today and Dr. Boyles is a, Tracy, she prefers, uh, is an associate professor and chair of the Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Oklahoma. She's an award-winning teacher and researcher in the field of environmental history, environmental ju justice, indigenous studies, feminist theory, and critical race studies. So the input today is going to be phenomenal. Um, also, your publications are brilliant, um, as you probably well know. Um, we're glad to have you on the panel, and I think that we're going to get a lot there. Uh, uh, Veronica, like I said, I've, I've heard your name, seen your name everywhere. I'd love to work with you on a couple of projects. Side note. Um, so, Veronica Pipestem is a librarian archivist at the Gilchrist Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She has 15 years of experience working in tribal cultural programs and nine years of experience in libraries, archives, and museums. Veronica is an enrolled citizen of the Oto Missouri tribe and an Osage head right holder. Additionally, I think, and I think this is a great focal point for collection managers and curators and archivists, um, Pipestem has worked with multiple language departments and collections which in my view is a very serious and critical need right now in archives um, and library collections and curating languages of native. Um, so the topic we have today, as you guys know, and I'm talking fast and I'm saying a lot of words, but silences in the archives, a discussion on how to amplify, amplify marginalized voices in your collections. Um, and I wanna start with this. So Rodney Carter, and Rodney Carter in the article titled of said of things said and unsaid power of archival silences and power in silence that archival power is in part the power to allow the voices to be heard however carter writes inevitably there are distortions omissions erasures and silences in the archive not everybody's story is told so today we'll be addressing the gaps and the silences and how to move forward um, to a more complete representation of those voices which haven't been considered over time we have three respected and talented panelists, which will speak on their respective fields, experiences how we can create solidarity within collective history. So welcome, we're glad you are all here. Um, and first, before we start, does anybody have any questions or concerns about moving forward with our questions? Mm -mm. Okay, so here's where I wanna start. Each of your backgrounds emphasize moving toward a sense of social solidarity in the terms of marginalized communities in your respective fields. How does this topic specifically relate to your personal work? And let's start with Dr. or Tracy, please, um, and, and talk to us on that. Thank you, and thank you for that introduction. I'm really grateful to be here, and I hope that <clears throat> at some point I get to meet uh, many of you um, in person. And I wanted to just also thank um, Jennifer Green, who's been um, 
incredibly welcoming to um, of me to Oklahoma. Uh, I just arrived here in the summer, um, and it's been uh, interesting getting to know folks uh, in this community. And I just want to say that um, these are the kinds of experiences that make me um, uh, more and more certain every day that we made the right choice to move to the University of Oklahoma and find community here. So I'm really grateful for it. Um, so Jay, thank you so much for the question. Um, I've been thinking a lot about it ever since um, I've been preparing in the last few days to talk with you all. Um, and this is probably one of the most central questions to my work as a historian who's trained in gender and ethnic studies. Um, and what historians, or at least academic historians, can and should be thinking about as they're doing their research and crafting their narrative is how um, we can read archives um, against the grain, uh, which is a concept that was um, probably all of you know, um, developed and explored by Ann Laura Stoller. Um, and I, I want to say that I've found a lot of reasons to hope about the kinds of narratives that can be built with the archives um, uh, as they are, as long as we're being considerate and thoughtful about um, the kinds of stories that the archives are asking us to tell them, to, uh, to tell. Um, so I don't think it's hopeless. I think that um, once you can come to recognize um, sort of the, the white and settler center of gravity that's built into, um, the, into most archives in the way that they're uh, organized, it actually comes to tell a fascinating story about how power organizes itself around certain kinds of people and values to the exclusion of not others. So I think there's actually value to be um, had in the study of how those kinds of archives are organized in those ways. Um, so in some sense, um, I'm interested in, in that as a kind of methodological question. How do we come to acquire knowledge about how these sets of um, uh, documents, mostly photographs, those kinds of things, how they come to be assembled and what kinds of um, knowledge we can glean from those assemblages. Um, but I do think that it requires um, two kinds of projects. And the first is to make sure that historians and students um, are being trained um, to do what I think archivists do naturally, which is to be suspicious and be critical about what's being recorded and why, what's being preserved and why, what is the, the process by which um, these collections of documents are being assembled. And then the second part of the project is exactly what we're here to discuss today, which is um, how do we actually um, grapple with those white and settler centers of gravity, um, but then also disrupt. How do we um, reconfigure um, archives and archival practices um, to actually amplify voices that have historically been excluded um, from the archive and from the narratives themselves? Um, and so I think it's a, it's a kind of joint problem. It's um, what's actually there and then what kinds of stories are being told um, about what's there. And often, as you all probably know, historians fail to see the diversity that actually exists within archives because they have a certain story that they want to tell. Um, so that matters as well. So I think it's, it's a kind of joint project. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Carson, would you like to answer that question? I'll read it again. Um, each of your backgrounds emphasize moving toward a sense of social solidarity in terms of marginalized communities. How does this topic specifically relate to your work? Relate to your work. Thank you again. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I, I really want to thank the Oklahoma Archives Association for hosting this important conversation. And it's been such a pleasure to work even re remotely and by email with Jennifer, with UJ, uh, Patrick, and others who helped prepare for this special event. So to begin with, I want to uh, locate my position in this discussion as a way into how I excavate information and why I do it. I'm a journalist by experience, by training and point of view. And that means that I ask a lot of questions. I can't help it. It's an occupational hazard. I'm curious, but I think these are traits that all of us share in our mutual interest in archives. So, when I first arrived to Oklahoma, and welcome Tracy, <laughs> I uh, wanted to really learn about my new home. I had most recently come from Texas, and I'm a native from Philadelphia, 
So I really had no context to understand Oklahoma. I visited the Oklahoma Historical Society as part of that journey. And in the course of my just poking around, someone asked me if I knew about the 19th century Indian and Black newspapers that were published in Oklahoma before it became a state. I was shocked. I did not know. And let me explain briefly why it was so shocking for me. Because you see, the journalism history that I had studied, researched, and helped teach never mentioned these papers. Traditional narratives focus on the East Coast, big city newspapers in the West Coast. African American newspapers are like a side topic, explored as an adjunct to the development of Anglo owned majority newspaper, majority targeted. And American Indian owned newspapers were barely a mention. So, a major focus of my research trajectory has been to answer why this is and to help excavate meaning from these periodicals. So over the years since then, which is about 2003, 2004, I published articles, presented at conferences, and published a co-edited book from the OU Press, American Indians and the Mass Media. These intellectual forays really paved the way for my current project, which is a book under contract with Peter Lang Publishing. This book, scheduled to be published in 2022, is titled Writing Home, Race, Newspapers, and the Culture of Place in Oklahoma. None of this would have been possible without my first introduction to the Oklahoma Center Archives and subsequent state collections. Thank you for sharing that. Um, as Mallory Covington is on is in the audience, um, she's a big part of ha having those hosted on the Gateway to Oklahoma History. Um, and if you guys haven't checked it out, the Black Dispatch is one of the best newspapers you will ever read. So thank you very much for answering that. Um, Veronica, same question to you. <clears throat> Yeah, so I um, take a little bit of a different angle than uh, the, these uh, first two uh, very interesting ladies that I've listened to their responses um, as a practitioner, as an archivist, and um, as an indigenous person. Um, so I've worked in archives and museum collections, and any of us who have worked in uh, small institutions understand sometimes about working and saying, I'm an archivist, and everybody just throws every collection at you. So I've worked in different types of collections for years. Um, but now at Gilcrease, um, a majority of the manuscript collection is either by or about indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere. And a significant amount of the art and anthropology collections are by or about indigenous people. And so um, that's something that um, we're really investigating right now as um, here's a little news and a little plug for Gilcrease. Um, of course, we got the Vision Tulsa package funding. And so we are currently working on a collection move and um, we are completely demolishing the old museum building and rebuilding a completely new building in its place. Uh, it sounds really exciting, but it'll be great when it's done. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're working on coordinating that move. Um, Helmrich Center for American Research isn't going anywhere, which is where the archives are housed, but everything else in the museum building has to um, to get moved and relocated. So the um, the the process in which we're we're doing that, um, we are consulting with some um, some, some tribes about the building. Uh, design and then we are also um, have this opportunity to do a massive um, restructuring and just total start from scratch on the exhibits and so um, that's a wonderful opportunity for us um, to really rethink how the collections at Gilcrease have been presented and, and, and the archives so you'll see a mix of different um, uh, types of collections together um, in this new um, in these new exhibits. And so um, as we think about that, um, we're starting to do lots and lots of tribal consultation. 
Um, and we have been doing lots and lots of tribal consultation up until this point. We still have lots more to do. Um, and we are, and so that's something that we'll all be talking about more in the, <clears throat> the later questions, but um, that's kind of my interest and my, my immediate interest right now. And so just my experience in working in archives is that, uh, especially in Oklahoma and Eastern Oklahoma, that so much of it is about indigenous people and there's um, so much work to do in terms of uh, the representation of those archives. So thank you. Absolutely, so much work to do in all of our archives. So the next question we have is, how do each of you amplify marginalized voices? And you've kind of spoken on about this, but I'd like you to um, kind of just go into it a little bit further. How do you amplify the marginalized voices in your work, in your studies, in your teaching, and what does that mean to you? And let's start, let's uh, start with Dr. Whoops, I'm sorry, I muted myself. Uh, we'll start for, with Dr. Karstoff in this time. Hey, thank you. So I, I love this question and, and just the, the challenge of being able to put in words the essence of what I do and, and also to hear from my other colleagues reflect on this. But when I look at the course of my work, whether it is research, teaching, and, or leadership, amplifying marginal voices is it. It means everything. Uh, philosophically, I believe we make better choices as a group, a community, a state, a nation, and a world when we have input from as many people as possible. It changes our underlying under assumptions about each other. So every semester, for instance, I teach a course that is has been 100% online on race, gender, class, and the media. And over the course of that course, I challenge students to think about what they know about themselves and how they get those ideas, both in terms of their own personal relationships, but also as amplified through the media. And we explore together these very powerful connections that really impel people's uh, perceptions and actions. So it means amplifying marginal, marginalized voices means expanding our education in the broadest sense of the word. For me as an African American, as a woman, and as a person with unclaimed American Indian ancestry, it means that I can help give voice and visibility to the ancestors who could not. I stand in the gap between the past and our future generations. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Tracy, how about you? Yeah, I, I really love this question and I'm, I'm so grateful for the um, other answers as well. Um, and, and I just want to say, since um, the gateway to Oklahoma history mentioned, was mentioned, that was one of the first things I looked at when I got here and immediately was surrounded by boxes in my house and was sitting at my computer doing, <laughs> uh, doing research, looking through those archives and was so blown away by it. Um, and um, I think, yeah, part, partly it's exactly what Veronica is saying is that recognizing that um, uh, what's going on in the archives and especially small, um, uh, smaller archives are, is, is actually a lot more diverse than sometimes the stories that we're telling. Um, and so I think you'll all be delighted to hear that I think that often the problem is on the storyteller side, um, uh, even more so than it is about um, what kinds of records are being managed and preserved. Um, and one of the things that I always, I'll start just by, by talking a little bit about my work as a teacher. Um, one of the things that I um, always tell my students um, on our first day of class is that US history has never been white. Um, it's told as a white story, um, but it's actually um, a significantly more um, diverse process um, that has been produced. And that what matters about that is the narrative um, and what kinds of decisions have been made um, about the narrative and which voices have been amplified. And the, the good thing about that is that that's about individual choices of whose stories we tell. Um, and so when I think about um, amplifying uh, marginalized voices, I think that there are a number of, um, you know, there's, there's a kind of um, 
mindset about um, knowledge production um, as we're doing research, which kinds of stories are we seeking out um, and which stories do we um, considered to be meaningful. And then there's also um, a kind of uh, tactical effort about you know, how do we represent um, uh, stories in ways that might have been recorded as white or settler stories, um, but actually reconfigure them in, in ways that are um, more inclusive and opening. And one example of that, just one example of that, is that when I write, um, when I use um, records from white anthropologists, say in the early 20th century, um, what I tend to try to do is to not actually use the anthropologist's name and find out who their informants um, were and whose stories, um, who, who was actually telling the stories that the anthropologist then used um, in their own work. And, and what that does for me is actually, it's, it's at least an attempt um, to um, give the stories back to the people who, the, who they belong to, um, and also not um, tell this in a way that perpetuates a kind of um, salvage ethnography that was going on in the early 20th century and to some extent still um, happening. So I think that those are all kinds of parts and parcels of how we can um, uh, reorient ourselves towards the sources that we have. Um, and also realize that um, the sources aren't necessarily the problem. The, the problem has been what we do um, with the sources. Um, so I think training students how to tell different kinds of stories and to make sure that we are always seeking to do that um, uh, really matters. Absolutely, thank you. Veronica? Um, yeah, thank you for asking this question. I think it's it's an important question. Um, I think one of the uh, the things that I want to talk about today is um, how how to amplify marginalized voices and how to center them, especially in institutions that are not tribal institutions. So my, most the bulk of my work has been working for um, federally recognized tribes and tribal governments, and so I've. Um, kind of now sitting on the other side of the table at Gilcrease where I'm working in an outside institution. And, um, but we, we have so many collections uh, related to so many different tribes and so, and so many different groups of indigenous people, not just in the present day United States, but across uh, Canada and um, Central and South America. So entire Western hemisphere. And something that I think, um, it is helpful to examine um, is your positionality as an institution. And so that's something that I've had to kind of um, work on as we develop uh, exhibits, as we do archival work, that sort of thing, as we, we create partnerships, is to understand that we are not a tribal institution. And so the exhibits, the types of things that we can do are very different than what a, a tribal museum or a tribal archive is going to be able to do. And we always have to be aware of that positionality as we go forth in projects. And so um, we don't speak for these groups. They are perfectly capable of speaking for themselves. Just no one has really asked them um, very often what they think of things. And so as we, as I read the Carter article and talking about archival silences, you know, I think there, that is true that there are places where that silence is being used strategically, but never assume that it is being used strategically. Um, I think you always need to have that explicit response from someone that they do, that, that right to refusal, that they do not want to participate. Never assume that because they're not participating that, um, that they, they are doing that in some strategic way until they tell you that. Um, but the other thing that, um, what it means to me as a, as a practitioner and archivist <clears throat> is consultation, 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 and collaboration. Um, so there's certain things that um, I think are really important for those of us who, who do this work is uh, consultation means having buy-in from your administration or your board to proceed as this can change uh, what you might think of as entering into consultation for one thing and uh, may have an effect on your access protocols, registration and session practices, curatorial practices and other parts of your institution's operations, even your collections care. And so um, having your leadership on board with this um, is going to be extremely important as you in, uh, go forth in doing this type of consultation. 
um, consultation means that if you are going to ask communities what they would like to see, be prepared to demonstrate that you have listened and are ready to act on those things that they are telling you. Um, that's one way to um, really damage a relationship is that when you ask someone and they ask you to do something and your institution shows no action, that, that those requests were not listened to, they weren't honored in any way, and there wasn't any negotiation about it. Um, so this is something also to, and when we talk about consultation, this is a long-term uh, thing. It's not something that's a one time. That's one of the biggest complaints from indigenous communities, especially is that researchers or institutions, museums, different places like that will come to these communities. They show up for six months and then they never hear from them again. This is a long term relationship, which is again is why you need your board or your administration to be on uh, to be supportive of these things and it's reciprocal. This relationship needs to be uh, mutually beneficial in some way that's within the scope of your institution. And that doesn't mean that you need to be doing all sorts of things that are outside of the scope for sure. Um, but you need to have some plan on how you want to create a reciprocal relationship with the communities that with, with, with whom you're consulting. Um, consultation means allowing source communities to collaborate on major storylines in exhibits so that their intellectual property is not further misrepresented um, it's good research practice it's just good research practice uh, those of us who you know work in archives and other collecting institutions we value primary sources but we don't consult those primary sources and source communities are certainly by their definition primary sources and so that's something that's good just good research practice across the board um, consultation means adjusting cataloging practices to include differing perspectives on objects in the collections at your institution it means being open to changing the ways in which certain documents are housed, accessed, and or conserved. Um, or if they're not conserved, that is also the right of a community. And um, I think uh, Dr. Voiles mentioned earlier, you know, talking about the practice of collecting. The practice of collecting in and of itself is a colonial act. And there are certain things that were never meant to um, still be around today or they were never meant to be anywhere but in the ground or within that community and so we have to recognize that as stewards of these collections that um that that may be the case in some of these things um, consultation means not loaning objects to other institutions without consultation from those source communities before you do that uh, because we don't know what kind of access protocols those things might have. Um, and it just means maintaining these relationships that's mutually beneficial. Um, so sponsoring programming that directly benefits a source community. Uh, hiring interns from that community to help in description, arrangement, digitization, etc. Anything that's re relevant to their communities. And prioritize the sharing of information about these collections with source communities first and any developments that you have. So those are some of the ways in which um, I think it's really important to center these um, misrepresented or underrepresented voices and it's, it's by asking them directly and talking to them to see what they want and whether these silences are strategic or um, or they're just not, they're just mar a, a result of being marginalized. So thank you. Thank you, it was an extremely thoughtful answer. And I love that. Um, I know that the Oklahoma Historical Society has worked hand in hand with the Pawnee tribes who have been really reciprocal in their language development and also straightening out what is Ponca and what is Pawnee or what is not the right kind of tribe. So I love that answer. Um, the next question that we want to wanna speak to is kind of uh, goes along the same lines, but can you speak to how the representation or the information regarding the marginalized voices, well, met metadata, um, historic and current can change these narratives in each respective fields and into the classroom, into society? Um, and I think what I mean by this question is, and you kind of each touched on it, is since we're on the front lines and we're talking to people in, in order to create the community, right, is, is relaying the information on how we can represent it better. So. Um, again, can you speak to the representation um, information regarding marginalized voices, historic and current, 
can change narratives of each of your respective fields. And uh, let's start uh, with uh, Tracy this time. Great, thanks. I think it's a, a it's a really important question, um, and um, this is something that um, I grapple with a lot in my work. Again, both as a teacher and as a writer. Um, and I, one of my favorite examples of this um, is actually in uh, it comes out of women's and gender history. You know, because of the ways in which we assemble narratives about the past, um, have followed uh, those kinds of um, centers of gravity around power structures. Um, that the U.S. history in particular has been um, traditionally told quite deliberately with men and masculine institutions at the center of the, the kind of framework. Um, so we told, you know, in, in terms of what history matters, we told political history, military history, economic history. Um, those have all been the kinds of narratives um, that we've relied on to know, you know, what happened with capital W and a capital H. Um, but historians of women's lives and institutions and experiences, um, of course, came to um, tell very different stories about the ways in which things changed over time. And so it was, for me, you know, uh, as an academic historian, one of the clearest examples of the ways in which um, shifting the focus actually changed the way the narrative works and the understanding of how things um, um, uh, how things have happened in the past. So, for example, in one of my fields, um, which is environmental history and particularly Western environmental history, uh, Western U.S., um, the kind of standard narratives were all about the kind of work that white settler men were doing in, um, in, in Western um, territories and states. So they were hunting big game, they were climbing big mountains, they were protecting big swaths of land. Um, these were the stories that we told about the environmental history of the West and it really limited um, it limited the power of the field. It limited the kind of work um, that historians were doing and the kinds of knowledge that they were amassing about um, the past. Um, so uh, you know, women's environmental historians um, have, uh, or women, not all, they're not all women, but historians of women um, in the West have um, developed really different kinds of um, orientations to how landscapes were affected, um, how, um, uh, women settlers really participated in the decimation of um, indigenous plant worlds in the West um, through importing gardens and, and invasive species and those kinds of things. And it really, really did change. If you look at the landscape itself as an archive, which is something that environmental historians do, um, you can't understand it without understanding the, the gender politics um, of how things um, functioned in the past. Um, the other classic example, and this isn't in my research area, but it's something that I teach, but um, looking at the history, um, this is just particularly timely this year, looking at the history of women's suffrage movements. Um, if you look that, at that as a primarily white history, you get a very, very different and less um, nuanced and less um, transformational um, kind of story than if you are looking at the work of um, Native Black and Asian American um, suffragists and the kinds of ways that they were framing um, suffrage as um, an, a, a, an important component of, um, uh, of, of uh, uh, anti-racist campaigns, anti-colonial campaigns in some cases, um, Asian American suffragists, including suffrage as part of a um, uh, anti-xenophobia kind of um, broader political framework. All of those kinds of things change um, and make better our understandings of how um, things have happened in the past. So those are just a couple of examples that I think are um, useful to think about. Thank you very much. Dr. Karstefan? Okay. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you again. Um, so I'm going to kind of combine some thoughts here and I want to make sure I'm on track. So part of what I hear you asking about is just this notion of representation and what impact it has on the narratives we create and tell ourselves and then the um, question about metadata and how that works into our perception of archives. So I want to begin with kind of a particular framework of that as it applies to my field in journalism and media history. 
Uh, so I kind of alluded to earlier how broader representation really impacts how we study uh, this core field of journalism, mass comm, and, and our histories uh, by extension. We know the saying that newspapers are the first draft of history, and this is something that um, has informed a lot of the way histories are told and created. But we don't problematize that in terms of its automatic assumption that in order to know who we are, we have to look at print, right? So the print format, the newspaper, automatically privileges a um, you know, white Western way of knowing. What about the authority of oral histories and lived experiences? So part of my own work is to try to excavate that and think about that in the context of what newspapers purport to tell us. So in the spring of, of uh, 21, this upcoming spring, I'm gonna have the opportunity uh, daunting as it is to uh, team teach a course on the Tulsa race massacre to reflect on a hundred years of meaning. And I can tell you part of what I want the students to think about is this official record of what they think they know, or, or first of all, the absence of record. Um, so it, just to even talk about how one can live in this state and have no knowledge or no history or no conversation about that. So this is part of what the students will bring to it. But um, what did the newspapers of record, the Tulsa World, the Tulsa Herald say or omit to say about it compared to um, African-American newspapers and narratives? So that's uh, part of problematizing that as well as the value of oral histories. So part of the challenge I'm going to extend to the students is to look through the um, skill of oral history to recover stories that haven't been told. So for instance, why there's more to this than the survivors of the massacre, their descendants. But I'm struck by the silences in the Anglo communities. I mean, this was a statewide catastrophe. So what stories aren't being told from those perspectives? Um, Tulsa uh, Greenwood is adjacent to the Osage Nation. There are stories there um, with uh, that perhaps we can unearth. So there's kind of a, a specific way in which our archives can be expanded even so far out from a significant historical event to lend meaning to the past. Now, about metadata, I want to throw out some ideas because I was thinking about this. First of all, I want to begin with what we mean by that in its simplest terms. So metadata, really literally data about data, right? And uh, any kind of system that points back to the original source. So often in conversations about metadata, we get caught up in the technology and you know what software we're using, all that kind of stuff. I think our focus, if, if we start with a focus on what it is and what it's supposed to do, it expands our idea of how that can serve us. So. There are some questions we have to ask ourselves. One is who's at the table to even decide what's valuable and what's not and how something that's there is interpreted. How can we improve that? I, I wonder if uh, for one, as archivists and researchers, we just might be a little too precious about our archives like oh you know and, and 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 i do and i'm not trivializing you know the very real protections we have to take to preserve certain documents and artifacts but what would happen in this age of technological interfaces the archivists rethought about what it would look like to give public tours of our archives to help 
uh, broader publics just experience what it means and what's there. Now, what would it mean for scholars to have a space to comment on what we're finding. Now, I hasten to add that I know the reality of digging around in archives and researchers find something that they think is unique. They're not gonna run out and announce it because they're working on the book or the next project. But I know from my own experience of digging around in archives that in the process of discovering A, I stumble across questions about B. So what would happen if we could facilitate some sort of space, maybe even on social media, where researchers could just ask questions and others could respond and exchange information about the questions we have along the way. It's sort of like crowd searching, crowdsourcing rather research and opening it up to a broader conversation. Um, finally, my last idea is to invite us to rethink internships and volunteer roles connected to archives that might be valuable as a way of expanding who's at the table when we actually think about the significance of these things. For instance, museums have docents often drawn from retired members or from elders. Um, what would it be like to have um, those populations come in and comment on what they see on photographs, on material um, archival uh, elements that have meaning. If it's the style of a dress or a per something that would have meaning, a different meaning for that person than for someone looking at it without context. Could, would there be a way of crowdsourcing um, these comments in a way that would invite members from diverse communities. So again, the bottom line is who's at the table when we're looking at these materials and deciding what they mean and what their value is. We have to expand that conversation. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, and I just, I'm going to give a practical example for you to hit on uh, Veronica here is that uh, worked with the Claire Looper Legacy Foundation and had the African-American community actually described her radio show. Um, because as a, as a white middle-aged man, I didn't know some of the terms and some of the events and some of the people that were really important to the community at the time. And it was a really reciprocal uh, conversation with them. And um, they described a lot of those by listening and also had a copy of each of the Claire Looper radio shows. Historical Society has all that information and you guys should check it out. Veronica, how would you answer that question? I know you have probably have a lot on this, so I'm looking forward to your answer. Um, no pressure on or anything on that one. <laughs> um, so I think um, at Gilcrease specifically, a significant, again, a significant part of our collections for which we are the stewards, and that's another mindset, I think, that um, those of us in the archival practice and museum practice, we need to very much uh, change that mindset. We are stewards of these collections and we are not um, for which other people are the owners of that intellectual property. Um, and that is something that really needs to change in terms of how we approach our collections. Um, we are trying to make a greater effort to, and focus to center um, indigenous and African-American voices and interpretations of these collections. So for so long, anthropologists and outside scholars have been the privileged voices in collecting institutions with little considerations of how their how or if their research contributes to these source communities. And so one way that we are um, doing this is, is asking these tribal communities directly um, right now, which anthropologists or which scholars do you want us to work with? You know, wh who have you had favorable interactions with and who do you you prefer that we work with if you want us to go and talk to scholars and talk to anthropologists because they do in some cases we have large archaeological collections um, at Gilcrease and um, they're they're they are suggesting names to us for people that they have worked with in the past that they have had a good relationship with so we're asking them first for that um, Again, this originating community knowledge is a primary source. 
um, we need to prioritize that. Again, it's rooted in best practice. Um, the other thing that um, I'm realizing, for example, in our collections is that we've had, um, we have large uh, Cherokee Nation collections. So John Drew, it's one of the largest collections that we have. He was an attorney. Uh, I don't, I think this guy must have passed away at his desk because he's got papers from 1830 to 1890. Um, but in that collection, which has been tagged and cataloged as, as Cherokee, um, and there are other Cole Cherokee collections um, that we have uh, have been treasures of the Gilcrease collection for many years, like the Bench Muster Roll, which is one of the rolls um, that was collected in Fort Smith as people came over on removal. And there's been this perception that we have very little African American uh, collection, uh, you know, collections at Gilcrease. But when you look at something like like the Bench Muster Roll, you get um, you know the roll of Cherokee citizens at the time uh, by age and then in the next columns it's all enslaved people. Well that's very much um, something that's been even covered up today you know in terms of not being tagged or cataloged or explicitly called out as something that um, taught, speaks to very specific African-American communities, the freedmen communities um, who have been here um, in Indian Territory and in this part of the country, just as long as uh, the removed tribes from the Southeast have been here. And so um, that's something that we are recognizing and that we are saying we actually do have African American related collections. We're just not even sure exactly all of the ones that we have, you know, because they have been tagged as only Cherokee. So that's where I'm trying to um, direct researchers to is to say, look at these Cherokee collections because there are also bills of sale uh, for enslaved people in those same collections. There are probate documents that list enslaved people as part of the probate in those collections. And there's just, uh, there's letters about people asking, inquiring about um, one of the runaway enslaved people that they, that, that belonged to them. And they're asking other people, have they seen this person or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it's there. There's lots and lots of research there. We also have, you know, um, the Mexican Inquisition papers um, that talk about inquisitions against um, different people and they call them out as slaves, you know, for practicing certain things. Now, I can't read any of those. We, so we're heavily reliant on researchers to come in, but people for years didn't know these were here. And so, um, but that's how his, this kind of um, silence gets perpetuated. And so if we can, um, and I think, uh, some are my colleagues that are on the panel have referred to this is who's at the table, who's getting to do tagging, who's getting to do cataloging, um, that sort of thing. And if we start to kind of search for those things and call them out really specifically, we can start to identify those. And it starts with us in the archive too, is looking at those things and kind of reading those silences as has been previously mentioned before. So that's one of the things that I would like to do in the future. I'm not sure exactly when this is going to happen is to start tagging Friedman objects because we do have lots of things in the archive that refer to Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole, um, Muscogee Creek Friedman communities um, because they have a large presence within these tribal collections um, and reading those silences there. I mean, that I think that's something that's really important to start talking about that and to start um, contextualizing that, especially in Eastern Oklahoma. So um, that's one of the ways in which uh, metadata um, is going to affect that representation in, a, in many different ways. Um, and I think Dr. Voyles, uh, reference this to is using metadata to acknowledge marginalized or silenced co-contributors to documents in your collection. So for example, an as told to narratives, recordings by anthropologists, um, the subjects of documents or photographs, those people um, were just as integral in the creation of these documents as the scholars or experts were um, in creating them. And th these scholars and experts actually gain notoriety by taking the source knowledge from these marginalized communities and they profited from it. And um, I know I understand Western copyright. I know that that doesn't necessarily an, a, a requirement in that, but I think it's, but it's a, 
I think as archives, museums, and collecting institutions, we need to be going beyond the letter of the law in terms of ethicality um, in these sorts of things. And so acknowledging those co-contributors, that's another part of that metadata that's really important. Um, if you have items in your collection that you suspect may be culturally sensitive, note this in your catalog and start contacting tribes about it. Just start putting a note in your database or whatever system you're using to catalog these things. Um, find out, and this is another one that I think is really important, but it's also really complicated. Um, find out the contemporary names of marginalized groups and use those terms as metadata and, and instead of the LOC subject authority headings or other controlled vocabularies, because those are, uh, well, LOC is super outdated and it's always the last thing to change, but many times those are outdated and or very derogatory to those groups. Um, so start looking at that and that's through consultation too. Ask them what they want to be called. Um, and so this is a kind of a longer term project that I'm working on is creating some sort of um, controlled vocabulary and replacement for Library of Congress subject headings, things like that. Um, this, this will probably take years to get done, but recre uh, uh, reforming those LCH, uh, LS, excuse me, LCSH headings and those sorts of things that create a, a much more um, robust vocabulary for talking about indigenous groups um, and in ways that can fit into a database and um, that, that a database can read and that sort of thing. So that's something that I would love to do. And I'm hopefully as we get uh, the museum reopened, <laughs> I can start working on that um, in, uh, and pay, put a focus on that more. And um, there was a question about local context and CI and TK labels, we certainly are working on adopting those, um, not only adopting them in just our database, but adopting them in our actual physical exhibits because we have, for example, we have archeological collections that through consultation with tribes, they have given us permission to put funerary objects on display and burial items. There are certain tribes that want to do that, and then there are certain tribes that don't want to do that. And through that consultation, we are going to put some of those funerary objects on display, but we also know that there are other indigenous people who don't want to come into contact with those. And so those TK labels are going to be a warning in the galleries to people who don't want to come into contact with those to just say, these are in here. If you don't want to see them, you know, you, you can go the other way. Um, but at, through that consultation, we know that it's it's acceptable for us to do that. So that's the other thing is the CI and TK labels. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with those. They're kind of cultural institution notices. Those are super important things. And they're things that are not super hard to, to add to your database or to, to your online presence. Um, I, and I think it it's a good gesture to people who are visiting your website um, and I have community you know people in my family who feel like museums and archives don't want to know what they know that that's not a place where they're allowed to go or say this information and I have relatives that can identify every person in a photo from 1900 you know um, and even though we're dying to know these things, they don't feel like that's something that they would even solicit as information. And so putting those kinds of notices out that these are misattributed or that they're open to collaboration is a really important gesture to, to people who may not feel welcome in doing that. So sorry if I took up a lot of time. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, that was a great answer that I was expecting. Um, I want to right now, you guys answered. So the last question basically is everything you've talked about. So what I would like to do is somebody, if, if we if we have a few minutes, I know that there's a, a lot of archivists in the room that probably have some questions, specific questions for each each of you. There's a little blue hand you can raise in the participants uh, section or just physically raise your hand and I'll look at you and call on you. But um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask the panelists on this specific top topic? or in the chat. Mm, I don't see any hands. Okay, Maddie. 
talk to us. Hi, um, thank you all so much for sharing uh, today. It was all just such wonderful information to learn about. Um, so my question is a little bit different in, uh, in terms of the archives that I, that I manage. So I work at the Oklahoma Hall of Fame um, and it's been inducting people every year since uh, 1927. So as you can imagine, um, it's predominantly white. Um, and the first person of color was not inducted until um, the late 1970s. And um, it's, it's a very small percentage of people of color um, that, are, that are in those archives um, because of who is inducted every year. Um, and one thing that I think the organization is struggling with is getting more people of color nominated every year um, because anyone can nominate someone. Anyone can go on the website, find the nomination form, um, and then that's when, you know, their file starts is with that nomination form. Um, and then, you know, once they're inducted, we have a more robust file with photographs and anything that they want to contribute to that. Um, but that's where our problem lies is we're not getting people from these communities to nominate anyone. And um, I mean, I, I think I have my own ideas of how we need to be more, we need to get into those communities and, and build bridges before we can um, expect them to trust our institution with those histories. Um, but I wanted to get maybe um, your opinions on that. Okay, uh, Tracy, do you wanna start with that? I, I know that the other, panelists have talked specifically about their specific groups, but how about you? Well, I, I mean, I can answer this I mean, kind of um, with my sort of administrative hat on as chair of a department and thinking about how we can actually um, uh, constrain the ways in which, you know, we're setting aside resources, um, trying to undo um, uh, the over-representation of um, uh, white men and women and these kinds of ways of honor honoring. So I guess my first response is a little bit um, uh, irreverent, you know, to say, can you say that we're limiting our nominations to non-white um, nominees for the next seven years or something like that? And <laughs> I imagine you would get into a lot of arguments. Um, and invite um, a lot of um, trouble. Um, I think that one of the ways that we try to do this um, in academia is to um, uh, change where we're advertising for different kinds of awards and grants and fellowships um, to make sure that calls for nominations are very, very um, uh, selective um, about where calls are going, um, who we're advertising them to, um, especially because if you know that there's a kind of current of knowledge about this as, you know, a um, as a prestigious thing to be nominated for among um, white Oklahomans, but not among non-white Oklahomans. Um, I think changing, I've I, I'm going to say this without ever having read what your calls for nominations or what the parameters for entering the Hall of Fame looks like, but maybe looking at the language of that call and what constitutes importance um, in Oklahoma history um, can also narrow um, the field a little bit. Um, so um, those would be my, my suggestions, but um, depending on, I guess, the legality of the thing, I think what Veronica said about going beyond sort of legal um, uh, legal requirements to ethical demands. Um, I do think that there's something to be said for um, uh, reorienting resources in a way that specifically directs them towards non-white um, uh, people, if that makes sense. Thank I'd you. like to add to what uh, Tracy said, uh, Rachel, and kind of use a media example because I, I applaud you, first of all, for being concerned about this. And I want to bracket this, though, with the context that to do this means a sustained commitment and really a change on all levels of how the organization approaches this. And my media parallel is the Oscars. Perhaps you're familiar with the hashtag, Oscars so white. There's a reason, right? So the uh, filmmakers of color 
felt that their work was being overlooked, wasn't being acknowledged. And so the first pass was to say, well, we just need to broaden uh, the call and make sure everybody knows to enter. And then you, uh, then a situation gets established where you have your representative uh, movie of color, but you know you're still going to give your award to the top uh, or who's perceived to be the, the top white male actor, say, <laughs> as is the course. And when pressed against that system, when giving an examination of all that goes into it, the reality is, is that, yes, we need to look at the criteria. We need to look at who's making the judgments, right? So who's on the evaluation board? Uh, how robustly do we ask for participation and, and nominations from the community and certainly broadening your call and appeal and your public relations has to do with that. But at uh, the root of it is the relationship. So what relationships does the organization have with diverse communities throughout the year? It can't be send in your, your um, nominees of color in January when we want to make this choice or whenever the date is, but we're not engaged in conversations with you throughout the year. So this is uh, a lot of work. Do I, I don't mean to sound discouraging, but I am, I want to position this realistically and to say that if you go into it, the organization kind of wide-eyed about these parameters, the rewards can be amazing because you've built a base of support that probably doesn't exist, as well as funding and contributors and all kinds of buy-ins. So uh, good luck to you and thank you for even thinking about how to do that. Veronica, did you want to answer? Um, yeah, I applaud you for your uh, your concerns about that. And I know that um, what you're talking about is really kind of an institutional transformation in what you, uh, in your approaches. And that's really hard. <laughs> institutional transformation can be really painful. <laughs> Um, for everybody, but it's necessary, and I agree. It the payoff it, it is, I think, is large, but the investment, the upfront investment, can be um, very scary. You know, as if you're not seeing immediate results, or you know, those sorts of things. Um, but it really does fall on leadership of your institution in a lot of ways to want to do that because power um, comes in networks of people. And if your the main deciders in your institution and the people at the very top um, really need to evaluate the networks in which they are creating these um, these awards and how where they're looking and how to grow those networks. And the, I think the same thing can be said for hiring practices, um, all sorts of things. You know, any type of recruitment that's getting done. Um, it's because there's a lack of a network. And so having that reach and starting with key gatekeepers or people that you can talk to in some of these communities that um, you're probably going to have to convince you are earnest, you know, in earnest that you want to do this and investing that time in creating those relationships may open up some doors to those networks that you need to have. Um, to kind of start recruiting and identifying different people and different types of people from different communities for these types of things. And so um, that's something that has to um, happen. And so then, because then it kind of, I think will eventually start baking itself in as those networks are widened. Um, and it, but there has to be this very strong initial effort to reach out to those places and to maintain those good relationships with those kinds of, with the networks of from um, which you're trying to recruit. So good luck to you as you uh, move forward in that. <laughs> so the common theme there was stick to it to, to uh, 
right? The follow through is everything. If we have a great idea and we see the great idea, it's the follow through and keeping up with that, not just the trend, right? Like what we've been going through this year, there's been lots of things, but we had to stick to it. So great question, Maddie. JJ, my friend, I saw that you had a question for us. Well, I have, I have a comment and a question. And my comment is, I just want to thank you all. I think this is wonderful. And um, this is being recorded and will be put on. But I was wondering if you would also be willing to share any notes that you may have prepared for talking today, because it's just the things that you've talked about are things that I'm looking at in my own research and my um, dissertation work and that I have really struggled with. Um, with interviewing archivists, I'm taking oral histories of Oklahoma archivists, just for those of you that don't know, is there really is this tension that exists between what archivists know they need to be doing and preserving and working with and partnering with and creating and then what like what you're saying with these people in positions of power who are determining what their actual work generated um, is occurring and I think wrestling with that tension and how how do we overcome that tension and I know one thing that's been mentioned multiple times is um, getting in a, a position of power networking with people that are in position of power but how do you do that with like with Maddie was saying when there is no open seat at the table for the work that we're wanting to do or the relationships that we're wanting to create how, how do you I understand that it's it's a hard fought battle and we have to make inroads, but um, I just wondered if you had any maybe practical advice for maybe taking that first step um, in overcoming the tension because it is something that we need to be doing ethically. I mean, we have seen the Society of American Archivists, the Society of Southwest Archivists endorse the Native American protocols um, and and but I guess we know it here and we know it here, but how do we put it into practice? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Sorry, that was a really long ramble. Veronica, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, you know, I, I certainly can share my notes <laughs> um, for the talk that, for today. Um, but I think outreach is our biggest um, it, it is a big factor in this and just getting out um, the kinds of collections that we have um, in, in just notifying some of these marginalized communities that we have collections that are that might be relevant to them. Um, that's one of the biggest things is just letting them know, even if they're not digitized, they're not per perfectly processed, they're not perfectly preserved, you know, as, as archivists, our backlog is huge, right? And I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, come look at this stuff. And it's not in the shape that I want it to be in for sure, but I know that it, um, it might be important to you. And is it? And what is its significance to your community? And that may help you in that processing, you know, the process of processing and creating series designations and doing those kinds of things, talking to people who are um, experts in that um, that content subject and or subject matter um, it may help you actually do that. There may be some funding that you can work with and, and create partnerships with these groups that um, to, to do that because there's all sorts of um, given the the climate that we're in right now um, there, there are lots of funding opportunities coming up to try to amplify the uh, marginalized voices. And so that that is a funding opportunity for those of us who do this kind of work right now. Um, so, and building in a fun funding structure. So talking to your leadership about building in a funding structure, because I think that's the other thing that, um, it's wonderful to ask people to volunteer, but a lot of times people from our communities um, need to be paid um, for what they do. And um, it's, a, it's an unfair ask, but if you can build in that funding structure for them to be paid to do this work in some way, even if it's a grad, graduate student or an internship or something like that within the networks that you have, um, building those funding structures in is really important. Um, 
And so asking and and kind of getting that that word out, I think, is the most important thing, because most of these communities will say, I had no idea you had this here. I had no clue it was here because, you know, digitization is expensive. Um, web presence is expensive. All of those things are expensive um, and they take a long time and a lot of capa organizational capacity to create. And so just sending an email, um, for example, many tribes have websites where you can get in touch with them, you know, um, and start, start there. Um, and start looking at um, Friedman, if you have uh, things that are of uh, value to Friedman communities, there's a Friedman organization for the of the five tribes that has a, a 501c3 nonprofit, they might be interested in looking at that, you know, those are those are different places you can go to, to start with, and then to say, if this is not the right place to go, who do you recommend I talk to? Um, I think there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. Um, I have to say it all the time because <laughs> I'm uh, three different, you know, tribes. So I don't know. I'm not an expert in other tribes. I have no clue. And so um, I don't know about everybody else or even, and I'm, and I'm not a spokesperson for my own tribe either. I'm an individual, you know, and so I have to say that all the time with people. I don't know. And, and as, as an institution, um, we're probably going to make mistakes going forward. But, you know, be ready for that and, and be ready to be able to apologize for the inherited problems that your institution um, has created um, and taking responsibility for that will go a long way too. So just doing that outreach and talking to people and letting them know that you're earnest about it, I think goes a long way, even if your collections are not in the shape that you would like them to be, whose who's are. I don't know anybody who has everybody, everything processed and digitized and perfectly cataloged, so. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're almost there, Rachel and I. Um, we're, we've almost got all the collections processed and organized. They're digitized, they're ready to go. So um, the other two panels, would you like to uh, answer JJ's question? Uh, yes, yeah, so let me interject and also piggyback on what my colleague just said uh, because I had thought first of all that I would love to see archivists maybe expand your definition of an internship and I know typically we go to history majors or uh, you know, very specific disciplines but again speaking from my area of journalism mass comm, we emphasize internships, but not every student can afford to go to Chicago or New York or work for a big agency or newspaper. And so this idea of creating local opportunities would be very meaningful. At the same time, we do need to think of some sort of compensation structure. And I know in talking to archivists, part of the reticence is, well, we can't pay, we can't pay, but, you know, something like free parking and gas money and, you know, free lunch every once in a while could be enough to sustain um, students and others who could, again, add some, uh, resilience to the voices at the table and look at the archives in a different way. So uh, what could a student who's training to work in advertising and public relations do for the archives? Maybe something on messaging. They won't be the experts on cataloging, but there might be some other skills that they could bring. Uh, the other last thing I want to leave you with is uh, advice I got from my parents, and, and maybe you can think of how to make it a parallel situation in, in the world of archiving, but my parents were very active in civil rights movement in Philadelphia, at, and one of the things that their group did was a successful boycott of Pepsi-Cola because they were protesting citywide about the practices of not hiring African Americans. One of the frustrations that apparently I'm told the, uh, the management had was how the African American community anticipated their next steps, had an answer for it and, and a solution and they felt thwarted, boycott ended, African Americans were hired. My parents then said, well, what they didn't know was that 
the African-American janitor who they didn't pay attention to, who was taken out to trash during their board meetings, heard everything and was a member of one of the leading churches in the community. So the advice is make friends in low places. We talk about you know, wanting to connect with the power elite. Well, maybe you can't get to the CEO, but you should make friends with the secretary or someone else because that can be your pathway into meaningful relationships. And in communities of color, there's a lot of power in people who otherwise don't have official titles that validate that. So. One of our favorite resources is um, uh, Lois Butler Washington, who was the assistant to Carl Albert um, and we cannot wait for her if we can talk her into come talking to us about the behind the scene, what really happened, um, and not just what we've learned in school. Tracy, did you want to take, uh, take answer JJ's question? And then after your question, then we'll just wrap it up so everybody can go get their sandwiches or whatever you have for lunch. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I'll just say I think that um, that these answers were really fantastic. And, I, you know, I'm happy to share my notes. I'm not I'm sure that they'll... Um, they did include a few things that we haven't had a chance to talk about. So maybe that'll be helpful. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, happy to do that. Um, and, you know, just thinking about, you know, some of these conversations around um, things like how to build in internships and, and things like that, I think all come out of a recognition that doing archival work is a privileged activity. You know, it requires um, uh, access, it requires knowledge of what constitutes an, uh, what an archive is um, and where to go to find it. Um, I know that, you know, I can share that for about four years of my um, academic life, I wasn't actually able to do much in the way of archival research at all because I had um, very small babies at home, you know, and, and I just actually couldn't leave the house for very long. <laughs> you know, those are the kinds of limitations that we think about when we think, you know, there's so many diverse limitations to um, how folks do and do not have um, access and those kinds of things. And I don't think that there's a one size fits all solution, but I think that we can um, take some steps, um, like what the other panelists pointed out, um, in the direction of um, uh, building some equity um, into access, uh, which I think is, is, is important and those kinds of um, um, efforts are always appreciated, I think. Um, so I think there's a lot of good answers to, to that question, and I think they mostly were covered um, by the other two panelists, but I love the question and it sounds like you're doing wonderful work. Well, I want to say thank you. This has been one of my favorite sessions I've been to in the last two years of conferences, I'm telling you. Um, this is so important right now. And as all of us, professors and archivists and librarians and everything, we're literally on the front line to history. <laughs> we are giving people what they're learning, right? So it's, 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 so, it's so perfect. Um, if, if anybody has any questions or concerns, first of all, let's thank the um, conference board people and the OAA folks that have put this on and ask these people to come share with us. There couldn't have been any better panel. Um, and thank you for your questions. And uh, if that's, if that's uh, everything, then I hope that everybody has the, the rest of the day is good. Sarah, did you, wanna, did you wanna say anything before we move on? Yeah, just a quick reminder um, that this is um, your lunch break and then um, we hope you come back at one o'clock for the collecting in the moment session with Sean Ferguson who's joined us earlier today. That's great um, from Northeast Document Conservation Center. Um, so you're free until one. Go catch up, take a walk, do what you need to do and we look forward to seeing you back.